Chapter Five of the Phantom Town Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Phantom Town Mystery, by Carol Norton. Chapter Five. Poor little Bodle. Old Mister Harvey was dozing in a tilted armchair close to his stove. He sat up with a start when his discordant-toned bell rang, and blinked into the half-darkness near the door. The smoked chimney on his hanging kerosene lamp in the middle of the room, and near the ceiling, did little to illumine the place. When he saw who his visitors were, he gave his queer cackling laugh. <laughs> well, I'll be dinged if I weren't a-dreamin' I was back in hold-up days and that some of them there bandits was bustin to clean out my stock then as he rose almost creakingly he said disparagingly as he glanced about at the dust and cobweb covered shells not as how they'd find anything now worth the totin away having by that time gone around the back of his long counter he peered through misty spectacles at mary is there something i could be gettin for you little miss he asked jerry stepped forward and placed a half dollar on the counter stamps please mr harvey he said i reckon that's all we're wanting tonight thanks the cowboy put the stamps in his pocket dropped his mother's letter in a slot and turned as though he were about to leave but mary detained him with oh jerry you don't have to hurry away, do you? I thought, her sweet appealing smile turned toward the old man, that perhaps Mr. Harvey might be willing to tell us a story if we stayed a while. Sure is shootin'. The unkempt old man seemed pleased, indeed, to walk into Mary's trap. Yo sat here, little miss. It was his own chair by the stove he was offering. No, indeed, Mary protested. That one just fits you. Jerry and Dick are bringing some in from the porch. The boys sat on the counter. The girls, trying to hide triumphant smiles, drew their chairs close to the stove. Old Mr. Harvey put in another stick. Then, chewing on an end of gray whisker, he peered over his glasses at Mary a moment before asking, "'Was there anything special you wanted to hear tell about?' Mary leaned forward, her pretty face animated. "'Oh, yes, Mr. Harvey. This afternoon Dora and I saw that small stone house that's built so it's almost hidden on a cliff of the mountains. Can you tell us anything about the man who built it, why he did it, and what became of him?' The old man's shaggy brows drew together thoughtfully. He seemed to hesitate. Mary glanced at Dora, who said with eager interest, Oh, that would be a thrilling story, I'm sure. I'd just love to hear it." Wisely, the boys, who were not in the line of the old man's vision, said nothing. In fact, he seemed to have forgotten their presence. The storekeeper was silent for so long, staring straight ahead of him at the stove, that the girls thought they also had been forgotten. Then suddenly he looked up and smiled toothlessly at Mary nodding his grisly head many times before he spoke. "'Well, I reckon Sven Peterson wouldn't want to hold me to secrecy no longer. Thirty years back, tis, since he—' Suddenly he paused and held up a bony, shaky hand. "'You didn't hear no gunshot, did you?' The girls had heard nothing. They glanced almost fearfully up at the boys. Jerry shook his head and put a finger to his lips. The girls understood that he thought it wise that the old man continue to forget their presence. "'Wall, I reckon the wind's risin' and suthin' loose banged. There's plenty loose, that's sartin." Then turning rather blankly toward Mary, he asked in a childlike manner, "'What was we talking about?' Mary drew her chair closer and smiled confidingly at him. You were going to tell us, Mr. Harvey, why Mr. Peterson built that rock house, and— Sho, sho, so I was. It was forty year last Christmas he come to Gleason. 
A tall, skinny feller he was, not so very old, nor so young neither. It was an awful blizzardy night, and there weren't nobody at all out in the streets. I was just reckonin' as how I'd turn in, when the door bust open, and the wind tore things off on the shelves. I had to help get it shut. Then I looked at what had blown in. He looked like a feller that was most starved and more'n half crazy. His palish blue eyes was wild. I sot him down in this here chair by the fire, and staked him to some hot grub. I'd seen half-starved critters eat. He snapped at the grub just that away. When he'd et till I reckoned as how he'd bust, he sank down in that chair, and dot blast it if he didn't start snoring. And he hadn't said nothin', nohow. Well, I seen as how he wa'n't goin' to wake, so I lay down in my bunk with my clothes on, and sort of sleepin' with one eye open, not knowin' what sort of a loon I was givin' shelter to. The blizzard kept on all the next day and the next. Not a gol darn soul come to the store, so me and him had plenty of time to get to knowin' each other. Arter he drunk some hot coffee, he unloosed his tongue, though what he said was so half foreign, I went quick to cotch on to his meanin's. The heft of his yarn was like this. He and his little sister, Bodle, he named her, had come from Denmark to New York. Thar he'd picked up some of America's way of talking, and enough money to get west. Some Danish feller had told him about these here rich quick mines, so he took a stage and fetched Bodle. The old man paused and Mary, leaning forward, put her hand on his arm. "'Oh, Mr. Harvey, tell us about that little girl. How old was she, and what happened to her?' The old man's head shook sadly. "'Bad enough things happened to her, I reckon. She must have been a purty little critter. Chiny blue eyes, as Van Peterson said she had, and hair like yeller corn silk when it first comes out. She was the apple of his eye.' the only livin' thing he cared for. I sure was plumb sorry for him. But do tell us what happened to her, Mary urged, fearing that the old man's thought was wandering. Well, appears like the stage was held up on a mountain road nigh here, the worst road in the country hereabouts. There weren't no passengers but Sven Peterson and Little Bodle, the long journey being about to an end. That thar blizzard was a threatenin', and the stage driver was hurryin' his hosses, hopin' to get over the mountain before it struck, when up rode three men. One of em shot the driver, another of em dragged out a bag of gold ore, then they fired over the hosses' heads, skeered and rarin' them horses plunged over the cliff, and down that stage crashed into the worst gulch there is in these here parts. Sven saw his little sister throwed out into the road. Then, as the stage keeled over, he jumped and cotched on to some scrub tree grown out of the cliff. It took him a long spell to climb back to the road. He was loony wild with worrying about little Bodle. He ran to where he'd seen her throwed out. She wa'n't there. He hunted and called, but there wa'n't no answer. Then he reckoned as how that there third bandit had whirled back and carried her off. Oh, Mr. Harvey, how terrible! There were tears in Mary's eyes. Wasn't she ever found? The old man shook his head sadly. Sven Peterson followed them bandits afoot all night and next day, but they was a horseback, and he couldn't even get sight of them. Then the blizzard struck, and he staggered in here, being as he saw my light. After that he went prospectin' all around these here mountains, and he struck it rich. That cliff, where he built him a rock house, was one of his claims. I suppose he never stopped hunting for poor little Bodle. Mary's voice was tender with sympathy. You reckon right, little gal. Whenever Sven Peterson heard tell of a hold up anywhere in the state, he joined a posse that was hunting him, but it weren't no use nohow. Bodle was plumb gone. 
Sven Peterson never made no friend but me. His palish blue eyes always kept that wild look, and as time went on, and he piled up gold and turquoise, he got to be dubbed Lucky Loon. The old man paused, and started to nod his shaggy gray head so many times that Dora, fearing he would nod himself to sleep, asked, Mr. Harvey, what was his evil eye turquoise? Eh? Hey? The old man glanced up suspiciously. So you'd heard about that. Then he cackled his queer, cracked laugh. <laughs> I heard about it, but I'd always reckoned that there weren't no such thing. I calculated Sven Peterson made up that yarn to keep folks from climbing up to his rock house and stealing his gold and turquoise, if be that's where he kept it. I reckon as how that's the heft of that yarn, and yet, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe there was something to it. Maybe there was. Oh, Mr. Harvey, we'd like awfully well to hear the story whether it's true or not. Unless, Mary said solicitously, unless you're too sleepy to tell it. The old man sat up and opened his eyes wide. Sleepy? Me sleepy? Never was waked up more. Well, this here is the heft of that tale. End of chapter 5 Recording by Bill Borst